fireworks uh, for those of you that know if the timer ends on like a it's like three different numbers you get fireworks at the end I spent a lot of time figuring all that out years ago but I thought that would be a nice introduction to a new series of sermons that we begin today called the games we play we are going to be looking at video games and other types of games for some of the things that happen in those games that also happen in the games that we play in real life, games that we play in relationships, in business, and in work, and even with God. And the topic for today is this idea of leveling up. So there at the end of the Mario scene, Mario gets to the end of level one, and now he gets to move to level two. And in Mario, that keeps going on, on and on and on. You always have to get to the next level, to the next level, or it's game over. In other games, leveling up looks a little bit different. The characters themselves, when they meet certain goals or they accomplish certain missions, the characters themselves level up and they get new skills and abilities that if they don't have them, they won't be able to overcome the next obstacle, defeat the next enemy. They won't be able to win the game and they'll lose. And so in, in video games, there's this constant thing of you have to always be leveling up and leveling up and leveling up. And I have found that it's kind of like that in, in our lives as, as well. And I'm going to ask you a question or ask you to think about something because this is what got me thinking about this just recently, someone I was having a conversation with. And what I want to ask you to do is if you are a woman, I want you to picture yourself at age 40. Could be in the future, could be in the past, could be right now. But if you're a woman, I want to ask you to picture yourself at 40. If you are a man, I want to ask you to picture yourself at 38. Okay, you got that picture in your mind? That is going to be our mark because statistically, that is for U.S. Americans the halfway point of your lifespan. Okay, you got that? that that's a mark that's out there. Now I want you to think of where you are now, and I want to throw out this question. Is where you are now professionally and personally good enough for where you are chronologically, knowing where the half point of your life is? That's a like really uncomfortable question, and it's one I would have never asked, except that it ties into this leveling up, because I was talking about ages with someone the other day, and, and they remarked where they were in relationship to halfway through life and where I was, and it got me asking that question, well, here's where I am. Is, is that good enough? And in our society, you're going to constantly get messages that say, wherever you are, it's not good enough. You're also going to get the message in our society that that's okay, because if you just buy this product, it'll be all better. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of how it works. So when I turn to the scriptures and look at Jesus, it was a little bit of a surprise to me to see that he also wanted his followers constantly to be leveling up and to be growing. But Jesus put a very distinctive character to what that looked like. And one of the places I see it the most clearly is in his last supper with his disciples. And so I want to spend some time this morning taking you through that supper and what happened there and how it relates to this idea of leveling up. I want to show you a picture of an archaeological excavation in southern Italy. It was a formal Roman dining room dated to about 79 AD. So this is in the first century, about 30 years or 40 years after Jesus. This was what a formal dining room looked like, probably along similar lines to what the dining room looked like when Jesus had his last supper with his disciples on the night that he was to be arrested and then and later crucified. What I want you to notice on the floor are those little ramps. They would put cushions on those and the diners would recline and actually lay down at dinner. And then that little 
aisle in the middle, they'd set up tables around the edge of that aisle to put food, and then there'd still be a space where servants could walk in and out and, and refill food and drinks. And so imagine this is the dining room that Jesus was in with his last disciples. I want to show you, an, or with his disciples for his last supper. I want to show you another picture, which is a painting that tried to put obviously the characters aren't accurate, but a historically accurate painting. You'll see Jesus. He's the one in white over there on the left-hand side, and that's where the host would sit, and then places of honor to his left and right and the other people around the table. So imagine this scene. It's a Thursday night in Jerusalem. The disciples have gathered. It's about maybe seven in the evening, and they've gathered to celebrate the Passover Seder dinner. This was a Jewish annual religious celebration where they would come together and they would remember the time in history when God through Moses had led God's people out of slavery in Egypt into freedom. And the whole meal was scripted in such a way that you would recall that this God is a God who has set people free and where you would claim the promise that that God is still setting people free today. And so there would be certain prayers that you would say, and there would be certain songs that you would sing, there would be certain stories that you would tell. Even the food itself had symbolic significance. Uh, They would have, they'd eat a little bit of horseradish root, very bitter, for instance, and they would say, remember how bitter it was to be in slavery and how bitter slavery is. And so they would do all of these things. It was a long dinner. Uh, If it started at 7, it had to be finished by midnight, but it could go up until midnight, so four, five hours. And so there was plenty of time for conversation. So imagine Jesus with his disciples reclining around this table. The conversation is going around, as you might imagine, any kind of a dinner conversation. But then Jesus takes it and turns it in a very unexpected direction. In the book of Mark, chapter 14, in verse 18, it says, When they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, Surely not I. Then the conversation took another unexpected turn. The Gospel of Luke tells us in chapter 22, verse 24, that a dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. It seems odd to me that you could go in the same dinner from a conversation about one of you is going to betray me and surely not I, to at another time in the dinner having starting a a bragging contest and disputing who is the greatest. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how the conversation flowed that evening, but I want to share with you a a plausible reconstruction of how it might have gone because I've been in some conversations like this. So Jesus says, one of you is going to betray you, and they start saying, "Well, well, surely not I. And in my imagination, I think, well, you know, maybe Matthew says, you know, surely not I, and then starts wanting to justify that. He says, well, surely not I, because I left a lucrative career as a tax collector to come follow Jesus. So it couldn't be me. And then, you know, maybe Andrew raises his hand or tries to get the attention of the people around the table and says, well, well, so did I, me and my brother Peter. We were fishermen, and that was going pretty well, but we left it to follow Jesus. And then not to be outdone, James and John jump in and say, well, hey, so did we. We had a fishing business. Not only that, it was a family business. And the day that Jesus called and said, come follow me, we left dad in the boat and we went. (laughs) I mean, we really, we did it 100%. Not only that, you know, James and John, we were there when Jesus rose that little girl from the dead. We got to be there when, when Elijah and Moses appeared to Jesus. And, and, you know, you could see how it might start to transform from a surely not I to a bragging contest. And in, in, in my imagination, Peter, who you would expect because he's kind of boisterous, he's bold, he tends to speak first and think later in the rest of the Gospels, I would think maybe he would, would, would come out quickly, but I, I saw a movie portrayal of this one time, and he kind of just sits back during this conversation with, with kind of a grin on his smile or on his face because he knows who the greatest is. And, and in the movie portrayal that I was watching, the conversation kind of goes around the table and everybody justifies why surely it wasn't them because of this great thing that they've done. And, 
and he kind of, you know, clears his throat, and he's like, gentlemen, I, I, I think there's a way to solve this. Peter's, or Andrew's made some good points, James and John, Matt, they've all made some good points, but I just want to ask you to raise your hand if you've ever walked on water. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's him and Jesus. Those are the only, only two. Uh, but this conversation turns from, or maybe, uh, we know both things happened, uh, from surely not I to a dispute among them about who was the greatest. The kind of, and I imagine you've been in conversations like this, the, the leveling up, the, the one-upmanship, the telling the story, one better, oh yeah, that, but look what I did. And, and I imagine that was very distressing for Jesus. After all, he knows that this is his last supper with his disciples. He knows at the end of the evening he's going to be arrested. He knows his crucifixion is coming. He's been trying for three years to get these guys ready to proclaim his way of being in the world. And here they are at the last dinner together, and they're still competing about who's the best. Maybe it it was that that prompted Jesus to do what he did next. The Gospel of John tells us in chapter 13 that Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe and had returned to the table. He said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. So if you imagine back to that painting, they're reclined. He has them kind of rolled to their back, and then he goes around the outside edge of that three-sided table. He washes their feet which was a job that was supposed to be done by servants, certainly not by the host of the dinner. But he says, if I, your teacher and Lord, have done this, it should be an example. This is how you should do to others. And the narrator of John says at the beginning that said, Jesus knew that he had come from God and that he was going to God. That's something that we ought to be able to know as well that we have come from God, and that we are going to God. And that knowledge changes how we look at leveling up. When Jesus gave them this example of of taking the role of the servant and washing their feet, I get the sense that that leveling up becomes more about pleasing God than about out-competing others. It becomes more about supporting others than surpassing them. Jesus gives them this this metaphor, this action to say, yes, Christians, my followers, we are to level up, we are to strive for success, but this is what it looks like. Pleasing God rather than out-competing others, supporting others rather than surpassing them. I want to show you a photo of a man named Rhymes Moncure. He's not the guy sitting down in the fancy robe, he's the guy with the bow tie. The one that looks happy and like he's, he's uh, clapping and smiling. This photo was taken a few months before he became the bishop of the United Methodist Church in, in North Texas. And that meant he was the, the leader, the boss of all the United Methodist pastors in North Texas. And he was the bishop at the time when I came to the end of the candidacy process to become a minister and it was time for me to be ordained. The bishop in the United Methodist Church is is the sole person, there are multiple bishops, but it's the sole position that has the authority and the power to ordain or to make new pastors. And so Rhymes Moncure was the bishop when it was time for me to be ordained, and he asked me and all of the other people that were about to be ordained to come and meet with him at his office. He sat us down and he, he said, you know, I lead all of these pastors in North Texas and I have a problem that I want to ask your help with. He said, all of the pastors in North Texas, they want to be successful, and that is a good thing. The problem is, they've chosen to measure their success by the size of of their church and the size of their salary. 
said that's not how Christians measure their success. Uh, to put it in our terms, that's not how Jesus taught us to level up. And so he said to us gathered around who are about to become new pastors, he said, I want your help to try to remind them who they are and what they are to be about as they pursue this very worthy goal of being successful. And so he said, just let me show you a picture of what he did, this next photo. The night in a very special worship service, he came around to each of these people that were to be ordained, exercised the, the power that only he had to ordain these new pastors, and then one by one for each of us, he got down on his knees and he washed our feet. That being there, experiencing that, the conversation before has stuck in my mind that whatever we do in pursuing success, Jesus calls for us to have that leveling up and that pursuit of success to look distinctive in our culture. That whatever it looks for us as individually, it should be in, in the genre of things like taking the role of a servant, of trying to please God rather than to outcompete others, of supporting others rather than trying to surpass them. 